This is Jocko Podcast number 118 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. I need a mission. We all need a mission. That's what life should be is a mission. That's what gives your life purpose and focus and drive and ultimately satisfaction. Now, that mission can be the job you work at. It can be providing for your family or it can be getting better at jujitsu or stronger at Olympic lifting or starting a business that you want to grow and build and take over the world. And sometimes people ask me what to do if they don't know what their mission is or what their mission should be. And I tell them if they're in that situation to go help someone. Go help someone else. Make that your mission. Because that will make you better. And it'll make the world better. And eventually from that you'll see what your mission is. Now, I was lucky because from a young age, I had a mission. I wanted to be some kind of commando. And eventually, I ended up hearing about the SEAL teams and decided that that was the best place for me. And that's where I went. And once I got to the SEAL teams, I had a new mission, which was to prepare for war, and that's what we did. And then eventually, war came. And then that was the mission, to take the fight to the enemy, to close with and destroy them through close combat, and that's what we did. But eventually, for me, and for everyone in the military, it ends. Maybe because of retirement, or maybe because of family obligations, or maybe for medical reasons, but for every warrior, eventually, the war ends. And that career ends, and that mission ends. And I've talked a lot on this podcast about how important it is to find a new mission. Once the war is over for you and you've done your part, you have to find a new mission. Well, tonight we have a guest on who pursued much the same mission as me for as long as he could and who has now found a new mission that he is on. So, Dan Crenshaw, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jocko. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Real honor. Thanks for coming on. And let's just start at the beginning a little bit for people that don't know who you are. Let's talk a little bit about I guess we'll talk about Katy, Texas, and at the same time, also include Ecuador and Colombia about your childhood. Absolutely. Well, like you said, I grew up in Katy, Texas. Um, I had six generations of Texan flowing through me, my dad's side of the family, and uh, my dad was in the oil and gas industry our whole lives. So when you hear the things about uh, Ecuador and Colombia and even Egypt and Scotland. That's those are all the places we lived over the years um, because of his because uh, of his career. Everybody and anybody in the oil and gas industry in Texas knows that it's it's a pretty common theme. Um, you know, I like to talk about some of the challenges that I went through from an early age and uh, what kind of what drove me or maybe and maybe drove my that that capacity that mental capacity that you need to become a seal and. Um, you know, that started with my mother 
and my, my mother got um, diagnosed with breast cancer when I was five years old and she fought it hard for five years and she never quit she never complained I, I never saw it and if she did I never saw it and, um, and she just took care of me and my brother every day um, right up until the end and uh, she eventually lost that battle when I was 10 years old uh, 1994 but she instilled in me you know what I what I think are American and Texas values of integrity uh, respect and, and just never quit never quit no matter what and don't feel sorry for yourself because um, she never did she truly never did and she asked or she told me before she died that I would soar to great heights and I don't know what that meant at the time um, but I think we know now and um, not long after that you know when I could start reading books and um, and, uh, and grab the first Navy SEAL Dick Marcinko novel Rogue Warrior <laughs> That I could, your book wasn't out yet, Jocko. Otherwise, <laughs> maybe I would. <laughs> yeah, Rogue Warrior. That 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 came out when I was already in. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it came out right as I showed up at the teams. It, I, I'm pretty sure that's right when it came out, and obviously it created some turmoil in the teams. But it was pretty interesting, especially because I knew guys that had worked for for Dick Marcinko, really? and that was pretty interesting to talk to them. And and to be totally frank with you, most of the guys that worked for Dick Marcinko loved him. And and as a matter of fact, one of the guys, a couple of the guys that I respect, I mean, there's one guy as a matter of fact that that I work for and this was a couple of years later. As a matter of fact, it was around 1994 because I was in a SEAL platoon and, and I was talking to this guy that had worked for, for Dick Marcinko and I said, hey, you know, how was Dick Marcinko? How, how was it to work for him? And he looked at me and said, best CO ever. Yeah. And this was from a guy that I have utmost respect for. So I thought that was pretty cool. Even though, you know, his book, you know, the book is, it's, I'd say it's a Hollywood-ish book. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the uh, statement in there that everyone always laughs about in the teams is the statement that every SEAL on his team could bench press 500 pounds right yeah. right the, the number keeps hey, growing we're, we're not going we're not even going to make it realistic yeah. <laughs> we're not going to make it realistic yeah. we're just going straight to 500 yeah. pound everyone yeah. on the team right and so. that's just uh, patently yeah. untrue <laughs> and what sucks is when you do that with that thing well then you then people start looking at the book and going well what is true and what is not right and so and although from the way it's been described to me the events in that book a lot of them are compiled Mm -hmm. So like this little thing happened on a training event and this thing happened on a training event and this thing happened on a training event But they'd all be compiled into one big story and yeah, right. so it's kind of like a Hollywood. Yeah, it's a book It's a it's a nonfiction ish but story. 10 year old Dan Crenshaw didn't yeah. know that was he was like say, I'm gonna bench 500 yeah, pounds. No problem. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here without uh, that series of books Frankly, you know, I'd probably still have two eyes, but no, nobody needs two <laughs> eyes. That's that's a luxury. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, we'll get to that in a little in a little bit. Um, so, so yeah, I mean that you know once once you've once that and you know this, most seals operate this way, uh, or, or at least they have the same story of yeah, it was just from a young age. I, I had a mission. Um, I knew what it was, and every decision I made from from then until the moment I, I I got into buds was 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 just to prepare for that. Now, when you did you I know you lived overseas. What, where did you go to high school? So I did most of high school in Colombia. Okay, yeah. And uh, so what did you play sports down there? I played soccer. Okay, because yeah. you I were was, in Colombia. Yeah, so you were going to play soccer. Kind of like what they had. You were going to play soccer it, it was, or it was that soccer. Or, it was that or volleyball. <laughs> and, you know, I was not going to play volleyball. And Try then to. you applied from college from Colombia. Yeah. yeah. And okay, this is this is kind of an important question because a lot of people ask me this question all the time. You were definitely wanted to be a seal. What made you make the decision between going to college and you ended up going to Tufts? Yeah, ended up in, in Tufts in, in, Mos yeah. in Massachusetts. So. At some point, you said to yourself, "Okay, I could enlist tomorrow mm -hmm. and go to boot camp and, you know, be a SEAL within the year, or I can go to college for four years and, you know, then apply and I'll be in an, an officer in a leadership position." I get asked that question all the time. For me, when I was eighteen years old, the answer was real easy: like, "Oh, I can be a SEAL within a year. Sign me up." Yeah, and and that's what I did. And for you, you obviously took a different approach. 
and people ask me all the time which one is better, and I, I, th- I tell them that there's advantages and disadvantages to both of them. Uh, but what made you decide you're going to go officer style from the get go? Um, maybe you know, along with my mission of being a SEAL my whole life, the, the, a similar mission of I wanted a college degree as well, and I wanted to knock that out. And um, and then you know, I wasn't well informed enough to to really speak about the difference between officer and enlisted back then, like I am now. Um, But I did want a leadership role. It was important to me, based on what I'd read and based on the movies I'd seen, that I was in a leadership role. Did you see Navy SEALs? Was that obviously? Obviously. (laughs) That's that's Leif Babin's answer to why he became a SEAL. Straight up, he's like, "Oh yeah, Navy SEALs, Charlie Sheen gets them." (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. uh, I mean, I didn't just see it. You know, we had it on all the time. So, (laughs) greatest movie ever. yeah, it, you know, it was, so a combination of wanting a leadership role, um, maybe knowing too, you know, was I really ready at age eighteen? You know, uh-huh. I knew I wanted it, but I also I also wanted to be prepared. Yeah, and I was able to think ahead enough to know that maybe I can't swim all that great just yet. <laughs> Let's we might need oh, some more okay. practice. Got it. Um, but uh, but but I'll, but it was mostly like it was mostly I'm going to go to college first. Got that's it. that's been my life path. That's what I'm going to do, and. And so that's what I did, and uh, yeah, ended up at Tufts University mostly because of its international relations program. That was that, that that was my focus. It was foreign affairs, international relations, politics, and uh, and I did a minor in physics just because. Uh, why not? Yeah, because that sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's and qu- you, quantum and you, mechanics. It's you, awesome. You speak Spanish, obviously, from from growing up in Colombia yeah. too. So, you, are you fluent in Spanish? Pretty fluent. That's yeah, legit. No, it's gotten a little rusty, but we're, we. Can get and you did back. ROTC at. <clears throat> Yes. Was there any SEALs there? Like uh, prior SEALs that were instructors no. or anything like that? No. I, I, well, no, there, there, there was at Harvard. So okay. a lot of these guys are doing master's programs yeah. while we're doing ROTC. They're not attached to the unit, but I did have the opportunity to work with some guys and, um, you know, just get that mentorship. You just, hey, this is the kind of workouts you might want to be doing. Right. I mean, just the basics because you just have no idea yeah. coming into do, it. Do you think kids over prepare for buds now? Um, I, th- I think it depends on the kid. I, I, I often mentor guys who want to go through and, you know, they, sometimes they do focus a little bit too much on, especially things they're good at. Yeah. Like I'm running 10 miles a day. It's kind of like a five yeah. minute pace. I'm like, stop running, never run again. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. you're good at that. Move on to the next thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, focus on your weaknesses. It, guys just don't understand the little, the little basics. I don't know if they overtrain. Yeah. I, I haven't worked with enough to really know. I, I talk to people. And they send me messages all the time, and they're on this two-year training program to get ready for buds. And I'm like, "Hey, train for two months and then go. Don't. It's not that hard. If you played a sport in college, or if you played a sport in high school, and you can run, like you'll get in good shape there, and yeah. it's going to be a challenge. But waiting around, especially when there's a war going on that you don't really want to miss, yeah, like, like that's a big deal to me, you know. And I right. tell these guys, this war's not going to last forever, and. You know, I showed up at the team in 1991, just missed the first Gulf War, and it's, you know, we I, I didn't shoot my weapon at the enemy for 13 years, and that's a long, dry, hard 13 years, and so yeah. you don't want to miss out on that stuff. No, you don't. One of my no. old team guy buddies, it was like 1971, and, and he... The, he thought the Vietnam War was going to end, and he's down at the Marine Corps recruiter saying, "I want to be a door gunner in Huey." <laughs> it's it's interesting that there's you, you know you always hear about the protesters and whatnot, mm-hmm. but there's kids that want to fight. Oh yeah, they they, we, we, we do have a there's a warrior class in in America that I think we should be proud of and be proud to be a part of because it's a they're good people with good values and they want to do the right thing for their country. So you show up at Buds. So you get yeah. to, we get done with college. College yes. is college, right? Is there anything particular you want to say about college? No. no. Okay. Well, cool. Because <laughs> I don't particularly want to hear about it. <laughs> college, and, college happened. Yeah, done. college yeah. happened. And so you show up at Buds, and any issues at Buds? Yeah. Um, you know, I started my I started with class two six one. Um, and about Tuesday afternoon of my first hell week, my uh, stress fracture developed into a pretty noticeable fracture. Oh. And uh, I got the old question, are you hurt or are you injured, Mr. Crenshaw? 
and you really want to be injured because you better not just be hurt because then you're just quitting. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was I was injured yeah. <laughs> pretty substantially. I mean, you know, I mean, stress fractures are pretty normal uh, injury in, in buds. Okay, so you so when I'm sitting here talking about people don't prep enough, you're like, actually, you should prep more. Do you think you could have run more? Preparing for buds, I, I would have. I ran plenty. I would have. Uh, I would have focused a little bit more on strength and conditioning. Uh, you know, something I just didn't know how to do back right, then. Right. Um, because what happens in buds is, I mean, you're going to go to failure. And it will, you're going to go to failure no matter what. You're, it's going to happen on the hour, every hour, mm-hmm. maybe every ten minutes, mm-hmm. all the time. So guys who over prepare, they 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 can't understand why they're failing so much, right? And that that messes with their head. So maybe that's what you mean by over preparing, because mm-hmm. uh, that that's what I mean by it. like I think I think guys get too confident in their abilities and they just don't understand why they're hitting a wall all the time. Whereas like guys like me are just like I just I just I expected to suck, so yeah. <laughs> it's really not a surprise. Um, but we're just going to keep trying no matter what and just never quit. And and, and quitting is never an option. The other problem is if you over prepare, it, it, maybe it becomes an option. This isn't the case for everybody, but I've seen some of the best in shape guys quit because it was just they were like maybe it was an option for them. Like maybe I'll make it, maybe I won't. But yeah. if you you should never go into buds thinking that way, and um, that's why a lot of guys who make it through I think have this story that well I wanted to do it since I was ten years old, so it was just never an option mm-hmm. for me to ever quit. So. Um, yeah, you do need to prepare enough to make sure your your muscles, when they do fail, aren't putting all the strain on your joints and your uh, knees. I see what you're and that's what happened to me, because um, it just happened over time and over time. You're limping a certain way, and that just that causes a fracture eventually because there's too much pressure being put on your bones. So, you know, or I just had weak genetics, you yeah. know, which is <laughs> the likely, more likely more, story, more, more likely <laughs> answer. Uh, so, I, so I got rolled back. I, I came back again with two six four, and um, you know, you know, you know, there's the that two mile run you do in Hell Week. It's like Tuesday or so of Hell Week, and it's a timed. I you went through a know. long time yeah. ago. Well, uh, it's like a Tuesday or something. It's a timed run, and if you and if you get in the top five, you don't have to do it again. And then everybody else has to do it all over again, and you get to rest under a boat and you know eat sand or, or whatever they let you do. <laughs> <laughs> I munch on that sand over there. And uh, you know, my first Hell Week, I was dead last. I mean, just way be like not even close, right? Because I was limping the whole time. In my second hell week, I was I was first place by maybe five minutes, you know, and maybe because I knew what the game was, but yeah. everybody does actually because yeah. the word gets around, um, it, you know. The, it's but it was it was it was a message maybe to myself of like we're gonna we're gonna not only do this but we're gonna crush it, and I'm gonna feel good about it. And I'm gonna rest under that boat and eat my sand <laughs> while everybody else is running. It, it, you know, frankly, it was really cold, so I kind of wish I'd been running yeah. at the time. But whatever, yeah, I won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the closest story I have to that is we got done with a four-mile timed run. And when we got done, the people that failed and I didn't fail, but there was a bunch of people that failed. And the instructor, who is a really a perfect instructor, meaning that his attitude and the way he carried himself was epic for buds. And he was the senior chief of the phase. It was dive phase. And the guys come across and he's collecting the guys that fail, which was probably at least half the class. And then, you know, he says, you know, because I'm fair, I'm going to go ahead and let you do this timed run again. Get on the line. Ready. Go. And everyone had to run another four mile timed run. Right. Well, not us, but the people that the people (laughs) that passed got to not do it. But the people that didn't pass, which was half the class, had to go and just run another four mile timed run right then to see if they could then pass it. (laughs) Yeah, because it's much easier to pass after you. you, On the eighth mile, you're definitely doing a lot better. Yeah, especially (laughs) after you've put out as hard as you possibly could for a four mile timed run, which I actually had to do every time. I, I failed a run and I failed one run. In buds, I, I paced myself. Mm-hmm. I said, "Oh, you know what? I'll just pace myself. I'm not going to put out as hard as I as I can. I'll, I'll save a little bit for later." And that didn't work. I, didn't. I failed because I'm not a fast runner. And so from yeah. then on, it was just a sprint as hard as I could go for the whole damn time. And yeah. Unlike you, I didn't win any races in buds. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally none. So uh, you get done with, and you show up. So now it's 2000. And what? What year is it? Uh, this is 2007. Okay. Yeah, 2007. Yeah, finishing buds 2007, and then moving to NSQT. Um, oh, that's right. Leif Babin putting me through through Jotsi. <laughs> nice. You know, I nice. hear I, I was I was I was uh, indoctrinated early on. <laughs> right. To on. You bruiser stories. <laughs> Check. <laughs> Check. Yeah, that's awesome. 
And then from there, you rolled to Team 3? Team 3. Yeah, it was Team 3 with Fallujah in 2008. And then um, back with in Ramadi in 2010 with uh, Charlie the Platoon, you know, yeah. your old troop. You, you know, going back to Leif running that course, it was interesting because what that course used to be was almost like an administrator course. Hey, here's how you write evals. And they had a little tiny bit of dashings of, of, of tactics in it, but it was, here's how you re- write evals. Here's your, how you write Navy messages and just that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, we knew that these kids needed to, trained because in Ramadi I had guys that were first platoon guys out ground force commanders and we wanted to make sure these guys knew what to do on the battlefield and and it was awesome that Leif went there and started rehashing that program and and did a great job I think it was very valuable yeah yeah and yeah so then you got done with that then you showed up at team three and you went right on deployment Right. I mean, you know, team three was already on deployment. So uh, they, they had yeah, just yeah. deployed, you know, and you know how that goes. Yep. Um, it's the, the cycle of graduates. So we, we met up with team three. I was in Fallujah for a little while. Uh, I was down in Basra for a few months and, and actually stayed on deployment to, to meet up with team five and, and, um, and, and help them transition, you know, as, as we were setting up another, uh, a debt out there in, mm-hmm. in, in Basra. Um, great, de- great first deployment and learned a lot, um, got to work a little bit. And uh, then came back to Iraq in 2010. And another great deployment for me because I was able to take over as platoon commander uh, when my platoon OIC had to go to uh, relieve another platoon OIC. So, you know, we were going through the entire targeting cycle, working with multiple Iraqi partners um, throughout Ramadi and throughout all, all of Al Ambar. We got to operate throughout the entire province, uh, even a little bit in Baghdad. So, uh, just an amazing experience for a young J.O. who wouldn't normally be put in that position and uh, working with some of the best people I've ever met. You know, we talked about before. Uh, I won't name names on the uh, on the yeah, podcast, yeah. but, you know. But, well, your OIC was a, was a great guy that got moved. That's why he yeah. got moved. And obviously, I had confidence in you to to move you up into the platoon commander position, which is an interesting thing. I, I had a group of business people and they they there was a guy that kept saying, well, no one can take my place, you know, and then he was surprised that he wasn't getting promoted. And, you know, I'll explain to people, if you don't have a person below you in the chain of command or two or three people below you in the chain of command that can take your job, well, then you're going to have to stay in your job and you're not going to get promoted. Yeah. So that that's that's proof that your OIC, like I said, who's a great guy, actually he's supposed to come on the podcast at some point, but he's a great guy and he had groomed you and taught you everything he could do and and made you ready and trusted you to say when the when the boss came to him and said hey i gotta fire a guy i'm gonna move you over to afghanistan is your is your aoic ready to take over and he could confidently say yes he is and that's that's awesome and that shows that he was a a great leader to to kind of prepare you properly for that situation that's a good point. I mean, that is that is part of leadership and management. It's making sure that below you and above you is is, is, is squared away, as yeah. we would put it. And I would do that when I was running training. I would always kill, you know, uh, theoretically or what is it, virtually kill yeah. the yeah, platoon before, commanders. All, yeah. all, all of us? Yeah, and sometimes <laughs> I'd kill all of you. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there'd be some, some, some buddy carries happening for yeah. extended distances. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was a little bit, I was a little bit crazy at that point, and <laughs> and you know I was good training. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know it's uh, I was coming home from Ramadi, and I wanted to make sure you guys were ready to, ready for the worst pa- possible case scenarios. You know, um, so then you get so you you do that, you finish out that deployment, and that was a solid deployment. You were you were running a bunch of stuff. That that sounds like a, a good deal. And then what did you do when you came back? So we came back. Um, Moved over to support activity one, and as you know, they they run intelligence support operations for the SEAL teams. Uh, it's it's a fairly normal transition to make as an officer, and, and for a lot of enlisted guys too. Mm-hmm. Um, but what that ended, what, what really what that translated into is back on deployment in 2012 with my platoon again, SEAL Team Three, Charlie Platoon, uh, in Kandahar Province. So. On that deployment, uh, this was one of our you know, more kinetic deployments. I mean, it's, it's Afghanistan, it's Kandahar, there's IEDs everywhere. I mean, everywhere. I mean, to the point where, you know, our, our TTPs or our, you know, our, our, or our SOPs, our standard operating procedures were, hey, we're on patrol, we're getting shot at, don't even move. Don't even go look for cover. 
because as soon as you move, you hit an IED. I mean, they're 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 just they're that prevalent throughout the entire ground, not just on pathways, not just in doorways, in the most random of places. These guys are just burying these things at a at a whim, you know, and then it's then it's chaos out there. And we know they're not that great at shooting at us, so we'd rather just take it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a moment just to emphasize what you just said because it's really important and not everyone will understand it the way you the way you uh, went over it quickly almost from a tactical mindset so I just want everyone to understand what he's what he's saying is when at this point the IEDs were so bad that if you started getting shot at by the enemy the obvious and common and practice that everyone in the world instinctively and by training has is you immediately hit the ground and seek cover and you get behind a log, you get behind a piece of terrain, you find somewhere to hide from the bullets that are coming at you. And what Dan's saying is during this deployment, the IED threat was so high that when the enemy started shooting at them, instead of finding cover to hide from the bullets, they would rather just stay put, probably take a knee, but not dive behind something because the likely, there was a likely chance that there was an IED there. Yep. That's, that's, that's crazy. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Um, you know, we've, I've seen multiple guys get, get blown up and, um, usually our partners, our Afghan partners who are patrolling with us, uh, because, you know, maybe they're, they're just not as careful or maybe they're, they're the, the equipment they're using to detect IEDs in the ground. They weren't using it properly, whatever the case may be, or maybe just cause it's bad luck and, mm-hmm. and they're just everywhere. Um, you know, it's, it and was, there's it, more, you had more Afghan partners than Americans. Oh, by far. So, we, we would sometimes go on operations with about a hundred Afghans and maybe 12, 15 seals. Yeah. Um, cause we're, we're doing entire clearance operations through villages, you know, where we're going house to house, we're shaking hands, it's a little bit of shaking hands. It's a little bit of on security, you know, either defending ourselves or going on the offensive. It, it depends on the situation. But, um, you know, we round everybody up. We talk to them. Um, you know, we have we meet with village elders. So it's 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 a little bit of your 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 I guess your more typical and conventional warfare tactics of we're trying to meet and greet the population um, while also, you know, being prepared for battle. And uh, and, and but the, the hardest part of that was certainly the IED threat, you know, only single file lines, everything we ever learned in training of different formations and, you know, Staggered echelon, whatever it is, it doesn't apply. It all it all gets thrown out the window because it's it's only about single file. What has been cleared? What hasn't been cleared? And you could you could veer from that a little bit depending on what area you're in in Kandahar and more mountainous areas, less IDs. But even then, I've got a story. You know, these guys, uh, s- some of our guys take a take a point, take, take a on the high ground on a little hilltop. I mean, just in the middle of nowhere. I mean middle of no i can't emphasize this enough it is the middle of nowhere right and they sit down and this pop goes off it was a blasting cap that went low order which means it didn't blow up the main charge like a 15 20 pound charge that would have killed all three of them right then and there and uh i mean i want to say that again middle of nowhere there was no reason for there to be an ied right there but there was yeah and this was this was out in the mountains and this wasn't even in the the pan, you know, the Southern Kandahar district, which is, which, which is truly just a minefield everywhere, you know? So, you know, the, the, I can't emphasize how bad the threat is there. And I mean, even, even taking the, even taking a small high ground position behind a rock, like, you know, this is what we, the kind of things we ran into. And, um, so that was that deployment. It was a lot of fun <laughs> and, uh, um, but it was, it was a hard one for us. Uh, you know, on month six about six months in this is june 15th 2012 um i was hit by an ied blast by one of these you know the, again they're everywhere uh, and it was it was the one day we spent in helmand province so we we went to helmand on a, on a last minute mission uh, to support some uh, marine special operations forces out there and uh as as the early you know we always, we always fly in about the middle of the night we do that so that the enemy can't arm the IEDs. See, the IEDs are everywhere, but they're not always armed. Mm-hmm. And if they if they keep them armed, they run out of batteries and they don't work anymore. So they so there's there's a little bit of tactical consideration there. But uh, you know, the, as the early morning hours come and the, and the daylight starts to hit, we start to move around and um, we start to clear out this one compound. 
and hadn't been totally cleared yet. And one of my Afghan interpreters was responding to a call, runs in front of me and completely gets dismembered by about 15 pounds of explosives underneath him. And uh, all I know is I got hit with something. Kind of feels like you're getting hit by a truck while a bunch of guys in the truck are shooting you with a shotgun. That's sort of what it feels like. And, um, you know, I immediate, my immediate reaction was feel my legs, right? So I, I feel my legs and everything's still there. Um, you know, I know something what is wrong. What was your distance from the IED? A couple feet. I mean, Jeez. it's so, I mean, because you know, I would, yeah, a, a few feet. Where you and me are probably yeah. is, is about, you know, just across the table. And, uh, you know, lots of pain, pain everywhere, but not in my eyes. So I was completely blinded, but, uh, you know, totally under the assumption that I just had dirt in my eyes. And uh, I remained under this assumption that there was really nothing wrong with my eyes for, for frankly, for weeks to come. Uh, and we'll talk about that. But, you know, I, I was I, I didn't lose consciousness. I, I knew what was happening. I could hear the, the moans. Everybody thinks that when somebody gets their legs blown off, they're screaming like in the movies. It's just never the case. It's a very different, like visceral sound of pain, um, and, and it's and I've heard it many times now because you know, this this happened to us a couple times, and um, so I heard that. I knew I knew that Rockman had been hit because I could hear him. And um, you know, one of our one of my teammates tells a story where he he got hit with a with a foot in a building next door. I mean, and, and it was and. That's how they knew something had gone terribly wrong. And, uh, you know, the medics come to me. There's nothing they can do for me. They, they sort of just wrap up my eyes. They know something's wrong. I really don't, frankly. I just I keep assuming there's just dirt in my eyes and that it'll be fine. And uh, eventually we get taken out of there. Uh, I was able to get up and walk to the helo because, you know, you don't let somebody carry you when they've got a firefight to finish. And... We get on, and uh, as soon as the medics on the helicopter see me, they they put me out right away, and I don't wake up for days. So when I do wake up, I'm um, in Germany. They they told me my right eye had been removed, and uh, I'd probably never see again out of my left eye, but there's a chance. And again, kind of self deception kicks in. I'm like, so you're saying there's a chance? We'll be fine. <laughs> Just get the surgery done. Get me on a plane to to back to Maryland to the Walter Reed hospital where these surgeons are and well, let's do this. And they're like, it's going to be a day or two. I argue, we argue, you know, th that's how it goes for the next couple of days. I can't really move. I can't get up to use the bathroom. My body is completely swollen and, 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 and shredded really. I mean, there's no real permanent injuries to the rest of my body, but it's, it's in such a state that like, I is just, it just shock wave from the blast? I, I think shock, and I was, I had a ton of shrapnel just throughout. I okay. think I was swollen, um, might have been muscle atrophy from being in a medically induced coma for so long, because I'd been there, been that way for five or six days, but really couldn't move, um, and, and just wrapped up really tight, because I mean, there's, you can see the scarring a little bit. Um, I, I was just, it was kind of been through a meat grinder a little bit, and uh, I was also, I was hallucinating wildly. So I, everything I saw was Afghanistan. I was lucid. I understood what was around me, but all I could see was an Afghan guy sitting next to me or an Afghan village. It was, it's, it was, it's almost like phantom pain, but with your eyes and there, there's a medical term for it that I can't remember. Um, but it was, it's just an odd and terrifying experience because it wasn't, it, I, I knew it wasn't real, but it's just everything I saw. And um, eventually got back to Maryland um, on, a, one of, on one of our medical flights. And, you know, my wife was there waiting for me. And, you know, we began to have that conversation about, okay, what's the next surgery? Because I had to remove the cataract. I mean, that was, that was the issue. There was a lot of shrapnel in my left eye, the eye that was still there. And, you know, the, the, the issue was, could we, can we safely remove the cataract? And will he ever see again? And even if, he, if we do do that, what's, what are his chances really? of having decent vision. And, um, you know, we, we prayed and we, I, and I look back on it and, and again that, you know, we call it self-deception, but it was really the strength to stay sane and, and believe that I was actually going to see again. And, and I truly believe that was God's strength is working through me. It was allowing me to, to believe in something impossible. Um, because otherwise I would have gone nuts because people sometimes ask me, what's it like not knowing if you're ever going to see again? And I always answer, I, I don't know. 
I don't know what that's like because it was never, that was never my mental state. My mental state was always, it'll happen. It's just a matter of time. And then I can finally get back to my platoon. You know, the, 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 the issue for me was like, when are we going to do this? You guys told me six weeks. All right, let's schedule it. <laughs> and, you know, it was insanity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but, that's obviously when uh, I hear this story, I think of Ryan Job who was w- with me in Ramadi and he, and he got shot in the face and, you know, it was a similar situation where, you know, clearly his, his eye, one eye was gone, but his other eye appeared to be intact and he could actually see after he got wounded, then he got put into a, a and, you know, he could see what was happening and, and mm-hmm. walked into the Kazovac vehicle. Uh, but, you know, they put him into a medically induced coma and when he woke up, he couldn't see. And then it was the same type of thing that they were telling you they were telling him which is look there was some nerve damage we're not sure and his attitude was very similar of like well it'll be okay and uh, you know it'll come back Um, but uh, you know what didn't take very long before the doctors were like no um, it's 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 not coming back and and I forget the timeline you know I forget the timeline because it's it's kind of a kind of a uh, a blur together um mm-hmm. but y- yeah for him it was he had a great attitude but um you know at, at the end it d- didn't happen yeah and you know and that's a guy that was still like and he, he also still wanted to come back and get back with his platoon and was telling me you know don't worry i, I can smell the enemy and i'll know where to shoot let me back sir so yeah uh the the fact that you were able to recover is awesome awesome and you know it's uh it, it shows it should show people that you know even though you had a great attitude the threat of of never being able to see again was very very real very very real oh yeah and and it truly was i mean we had miracles occur in the operating room multiple occasions and uh, doctors were just amazed that not only could i see again but see well again um, it, it, it was because they're in their minds they are like, well, if we do this surgery and his retina doesn't detach like we think it might, um, he'll still have, you know, crappy vision, you know, because his cornea is all destroyed. I mean, everything's a mess in this eye. And, uh, you know, we'll get him some decent glasses so he can kind of live his life. But he's, he's pretty much permanently disabled. And um, I just didn't listen. I don't even remember these conversations. Cause I think I blocked them out. And, um, you know, because the first surgery was we've got to remove the cataract. Okay. That went well. All right. We removed the cataract. Great. You know, and the next step is to put a lens implant in your eye. Like, like anybody normally would, when they have cataract surgery, that's just the normal thing to do. Um, we ended up never doing that because it's kind of like replacing a window pane on a normal eye. But if the frame of the window is completely destroyed, then you have to sew the window pane to curtains and that's never a good policy. So... Uh, they, they eventually refused to do that on me, even though I was demanding it constantly. Um, but because I wanted to see again, I wanted to get back and I didn't want to wear big thick glasses, which is what I have to wear now or, or this specialized contact. But then another problem occurred, which is a hole in my retina that was expanding and event. And this is, again, it's kind of a normal, you know, I, if, if you're over 50, this might be a normal thing that occurs. And then you have a pretty routine surgery to get rid of it and to stop it. But for me, it was incredibly fragile. Um, but we had to do it. So I went blind again for six weeks, uh, recovering from this surgery. So, you know, I was, I was, I was truly living in darkness for a long time. Um, you know, and not always, thank God I wasn't hallucinating the entire time that stopped after about week one. Um, you know, just, or, or just after my major surgery, my first major surgery, but, um, I went blind again and another miracle happened because they truly thought I wasn't going to make it through that surgery either. So after when they when you were blind again for 6 weeks, going into that did they tell you okay, you're going to be blind for a period of time and it's yeah. going to take time to yeah, heal? Yeah. It, it just yeah, because of the recovery process, you they they put a gas bubble in your eye so that it pr- puts pressure on the back of your retina and you have to be face down for 6 weeks. Oh. It's just the weirdest. What recovery. the hell did you do for 6 weeks <laughs> I got, face down in the bed? I, I got one of those uh, massage chairs. Uh-huh. Where you know you plant your face down, and uh-huh. I had audiobooks going all day long. I mean, it was great. <laughs> yeah, and by great I mean not great at all. <laughs> my, yeah, by great you mean awesome. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> was, you know, uh, yeah, Starbucks so, and, uh, <laughs> and and audiobooks. so you 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 had to stay face down all the time, or you um, 
and that six weeks goes by and then they eventually remove the gas bubble and it dissipates yeah so there's eventually a point where you're like okay it's gone now i can i can i'm allowed i'm allowed to look straight again and then and then it's just you know refitting your eye with the right eyewear you know the right glasses and contacts so i can actually get back to a normal life and and frankly that took years uh it you know it's I eventually, I'll just, I'll skip to the end. About two and a half years in, I finally uh, got got uh, referred by the Navy to an outside clinic that does these these amazing contacts. Um, there's only one company in the world that does it, and I can see 2020 with it. Mm. Now, not up close. You know, my vision's complicated because I have a cataract, but but I actually see 2020 vision uh, at distance, which is, I mean, just not even close to what they thought was possible. So, um, in but despite all that, I mean, I, before that two and a half year mark, I still had decent enough contacts to survive. I mean, they just weren't comfortable. They kind of drove me crazy. And, um, you know, all I cared about was getting back to the team. I was almost going back to team three. The, uh, the command wouldn't let that happen in the end just because I couldn't get the medical waiver to, to do it. So I stayed at what was now called Special Reconnaissance Team One. Again, we do intel support for the SEAL teams. And uh, I did a troop commander there. So in charge of about 50 personnel, a mix of SEALs, intelligence specialists, um, all sorts of, of, of really great people that, you know, as you know, s- support the teams and intelligence matters. And deployed to Bahrain, uh, worked with uh, Joint Special Operations Task Force out there, um, working you know, all throughout the Persian Gulf, uh, working on classified programs there, working in Lebanon as well. And uh, coming back from that, uh, told I had to eventually get out. I mean, I, I had to start the medical retirement process. But before before I did, I, I truly I wanted to serve again. I mean, it was it was extremely important to me. So this deployment to Bahrain was about 2014. Um, by the time I was really told I had to medically retire was around 2016. But you know, this process takes up to a year. And I asked that I, you know, be able to serve again in some capacity, let my let my the specialties that I'd that I'd uh, acquired over the years at SRT one, um, be put to use in the Pacific. So they deployed me to Korea for my last deployment in the end of 2016. And as soon as I got home from that, I was, I was medically retired and, uh, had to find my next mission. You know, like you, you talked about the, the, the earlier on in the podcast, I mean, it's, it, life truly is about mission. And, um, you know, I'm getting into politics now I'm running for Congress in, in Houston, Texas, uh, for the second district. And, I, I talk about this a lot, and from a from a political philosophy standpoint, if you don't give people a mission or you don't encourage people to find their purpose and their dignity, you you have a failing society. Uh, it, it's so important, and you're not you know even even think tanks talk about this, like American Enterprise Institute. Like our policies need to promote a sense of mission for people and help people understand that they have value in this world. They're here on this earth for a reason, and if you're not constantly seeking out what that value is that you contribute to society, you're not doing your job. And we need to help you do your job if, 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 if need be. But you, but you do have value and you, and you must find that purpose in life. Um, and, and guys like us, I think, can't survive without that constant mission. And uh, Well, we see it all the time with, with all vets. And, when they get, and I, I talk about this all the time. The vets that get out that have a no, a new, another mission, they focus on that mission and, and they go kick ass. The vets that get out and don't know what they're going to do that flounder around without a direction, those are the guys that end up in trouble because they don't have a mission. So they go and drink a beer, then they have another beer, and then the they could get prescribed pain medicine for their back, which hurts, which right. sucks, and, and they go down this bad road. And I believe a lot of it is because you know they just need that next mission. But you got done with – so 2016 – you didn't roll right into politics. You rolled to you. You went back to college, right? I so, had no intention so did of that, politics. Did in that become 2016? <laughs> did that become you? You looked at what you're going to do next, and you said, "Okay, well, how else can I serve? How else can I move forward? What's my next mission going to be?" And you decided you're going to go back to school. Back to school for I knew it was going to stay in public service, so I knew my next mission was going to still be government. I wasn't exactly sure what. I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to implement policy and strategy and. And take that tactical experience because um, I had, you know, because I had built an understanding of what policy in DC looks like on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, because the reason I was hurt that day in 2012 was because of an Obama administration's 
uh, you know, policy of always wanting boots on the ground battle of damage assessments for any any close air support. So, because earlier in that day, Marines had called in close air support on a compound they were taking fire from. For some reason, they wanted guys to walk across minefields and go take pictures of it. Right? That's not good policy. Now, it's not a victimhood story. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there was a battle going on. We wanted to go. I don't care really what the reason is. But from a policy perspective, that's that's concerning. That 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 kind of pressure is being put on our two star and our, and that's what drove that mission. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so it's great to see somebody like General Madison right now who says the opposite. I like, will not waste my troops' time with these kind of things. And he's on record. Um, you know, after we dropped the mother of all bombs a while back, he's on record saying, "I will not waste my troops' time going to count the dead bodies out there." That's just good policy. Mm-hmm. So. You know, I wanted to take that experience to Washington. Um, the, 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 natu- and the natural next step was get the right education. So the Harvard Kennedy School uh, of Government is where I went. Got a master's degree in public administration, focusing more on national security issues, economic issues, um, and, and, and a little bit of political U.S. politics. How long was that school? I just did a year, one year program. And, um, you know, it was kind of the uh, accelerated executive style program that you can apply to if you're if you're older and you actually have some some life experience what's the intensity level of that uh as tense as you make it i took i took about four extra credits <laughs> more than i needed to uh so i was busy because uh, i you know it's it's not like going to college where you're just getting through it i think uh i would highly recommend anybody you know you do a master's degree later on in life you're really going to get the most you can out of it because you, you care about learning you're there for a reason because you have purpose and, and you know why you're there. So I got a lot out of it, honestly. And it was, it was, quite, it was really an amazing year. I mean, you hear from the greatest people. I had you know, Bush's deputy national security advisor teaching us. Um, I had uh, you know, the, the premier experts on counterproliferation policy uh, teaching us in class. I had Reagan's chief economic advisor as my economics professor. I mean, hmm. you just can't, you know, the, the, these people don't speak in terms of like, this is what we think happens in the White House. Or, no, they're like, when I was in the White House, this is how it got done. I mean, that's the kind of the, the level of instruction that you're getting. So I was really happy to, 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 to get that education. And it, 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 it's, it truly applies to as in, the, in my current role as, as running for office. Um, I'm glad I was there. But, but I hadn't necessarily thought about running for office even after I graduated. Uh, I was looking at more policy jobs, you know, because I didn't I don't have the political connections. I don't have the background and money and the donor networks to really to, to jump off on a campaign uh, right away. And we thought about it in the long term sense, uh, for sure, but uh, but not in the short term. And uh, I was working with Pete Sessions, Congressman Pete Sessions on Capitol Hill for a little while, getting legislative experience there and um, working, doing some consulting and uh, eventually came to a head where I was about to take a job either doing counter weapons and mass destruction policy for the Department of Defense or go run for office because my congressman, Ted Poe, had just announced retirement. And we prayed about it. We thought about it. We uh, had the right backing from you know some well-connected people that I think God just put in front of us at the right time. And my wife and I went for it. You know, she was uh, she was all in, was all in, and uh, and that was it. I mean, I've already I'd already come back to Texas by this point to, to help with Hurricane Harvey reconstruction. I was out volunteering where in my old hometown of Katy. Uh, my parents didn't flood; they were they were living they've been living in Spring, which is just north of Katy, for the past 13, 14 years. But you know, neighbors needed help. Neighbors still need help. Um, it's it's still pretty devastated in Houston, and. You know, the, I think the decision became easy that we knew this was the right choice. Like this was the right mission. If I cared about pr- nuclear proliferation policy, what better place to affect it than from Congress? If you care about helping flood victims, no better place than elected office. Um, if you care about border security, you know, which Texans do, no better place than public office. You know, if we care about protecting Americans and protecting the you know, the, the sanctity of the SEAL teams and, and and pushing the right policies from the defense level, then. You know, elected politics is where I can do it from, and and so the decision was easy. It was it was it was the right choice for us. We knew we were doing it for the right reasons. We know we are still doing it for the right reasons, and we're not going to quit. So, uh, with all those things that you said that are are real positive about having a political career, yeah, you must have also been looking at the the nightmare gut check 
just mud slinging that you're going to have to go or that's going to be thrown at you and all that and and your family getting the microscope on them and watched all the time and no privacy and all that how did you weigh those things out and th- did you think about those things as well absolutely uh it, it's it's by far the most concerning thing about politics i mean if anything drives drives you out it's it's that you know and, and frankly the experience hasn't been too bad yet i mean i get attacked for silly things uh here and there i've got a uh, you know one, one one of my opponents uh, what i would call one of his cronies uh there, there's these there's these corrupt um they call them the slates in harris county which is harris county is houston um and these three slates are essentially three political mailers that go out and they, they make they they target senior citizens especially and they make it sound like there's these these um, these conservative review type of magazines, you know, these something with authority behind it. But really, they're not really they're pay to play. And it's just one author and they pick who they like based on what kind of money they were able to get out of the deal. And then they trash everybody else. So, you know, they put my they put my bio on there. It doesn't say anything about who I actually am. It just says I'm homeless and don't have a job and would like to be. I mean, it's it's absurd. Right. And most people read it and they think this is this this can't be serious. So and actually it got me a lot of votes because people would look me up after that. It's like, oh, well, this is this is who this guy is. Maybe I will vote for him after all. Um, But but unfortunately, that's politics. And that's that's the world we live in. Um, even though the you know the Harris County Republican Party has publicly denounced these so-called slates because um, they send out these voter guides and you know they've denounced them, but people don't always know. People aren't you know sometimes a lot of folks still rely on those. So you're battling this kind of corruption. You're battling this establishment. I mean, you know we always talk about the establishment in politics, and I never really knew what that meant. I think until I saw behind the curtain, and now I, I truly understand. Um, and it's this class of politically connected people and the, and the donor class that really just stick together and it has nothing to do with policy or doing the right thing for the American people. It's just how much money do you have? That's all that matters. And it's not, it's not all that matters. Um, we made it into the runoff after last week's election, which was March 6. Uh, there was nine candidates in my primary and on a, on an election day, I came out far and away first place. Um, we beat out uh, overall in the election. I was second place, but we beat out. So, just to again explain that a little bit because for people that aren't paying attention to the election you were in the in the fight you're going against nine other candidates going into the election obviously there's some people that vote early through Mm -hmm. mail voting and they just vote early and you were behind there but then as your campaign picked up and people started to actually see who you are when people came to vote on election day you you won election day, but you didn't win all the votes combined because of the people that had voted right, early and whatnot. Right. And Got that's it. Correct. And it, but know, it shows the trajectory and the momentum of what you're doing. Right. We've got some great momentum that we're excited about, and, and even put in even paint a broader picture. You know, we started this late November, and the election was March 6. That's that's a very little time for anybody to get a campaign together. So, and we're going up against. Um, you know, one of my opponents had probably will have ended up spending when the numbers come in between six and seven million dollars, which is a record for self-funding for a campaign like this. Um, another opponent, you know, similar, similar, very high spending, very much self-funded and was already a state representative. So had, had some kind of campaign machine in place. You're trying to catch up. You're trying to build a, mach- a, a campaign team and a and a, and a message within almost no time at all and no money whatsoever. That's, that's not an easy task <laughs> in only a couple of months. Usually you start like a year out if you're going to run for Congress. Right. Um, but, but this, that just wasn't the case here because, uh, you know, Ted Poe announced retirement about mid November. So we had a lot to overcome. Um, we built that momentum quickly. We worked hard, worked hard, got the message out, met as many people as we could and, you know, and it worked. Uh, we, we, we snuck by, uh, we snuck out of that third place spot because like, as you said, so we were behind during early voting and mail in voting because that, that stuff happened so early. There was just no way for my momentum to catch up in time. But by election day, we were far and away first place and, uh, we able to sneak into the runoff. So now we're in the runoff and that's uh, May 22nd. So we got another, you know, two months to, uh, to really prepare and, and, and get our message out there. And I think we're, we're excited about it, and I think it's going to go well. So you talked about this a little bit. You talked about money. 
right? <laughs> money. And as disturbing as it is, what's driving so much of who wins these elections is is who has the most money because that's how you get the advertising, that's how you get the mailers, that's how you get the word out there. I mean, if you don't have the money to pay for advertising, then no one knows who you are and you don't get any votes. Right. So as disturbing as that is, you without money, you 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 have a real hard time. I mean, you've done an amazing job with the limited amount. How, I mean, how much money did you go into that last election we spending? We ended up spending total about two hundred thousand dollars. So we were <laughs> outspent, you know, thirty over over thirty to one, uh, easily. And I would you could say more if if you count what everybody else, you know, what, what first and second place also spent against me. I mean, you know, something to be proud of, <laughs> but. Uh, so I, th- I so think you, if we can you re- raise two hundred thousand dollars, and you went up against somebody that spent six million dollars, right? And yeah, like I said, unfortunately, money drives so much of these elections, and that's why you end up with those uh, people that. I mean, I know you can't, well, technically or possibly, but you're not supposed to be able to buy an election, right? Right. But I mean, the the, the person that you talk about that spent six million. Without that money, I mean, where, where would, there's a female, right? Mm-hmm. Where would she have been without spending that money? I mean, I'm assuming she yeah. wouldn't have been anywhere. No. Uh, so not, she was able all. to buy herself at least third place. Right. And maybe if she had another more money, she would have been able to buy herself first place. Possibly. That's a scary thought. It, it is. I mean, it, you know, I, I, I don't like the way campaign finance works. I don't think you should be able to self-fund that much uh, for a race. I mean, you know, I understand that there's some good arguments to make that you can self-fund you know, over what the individual limit is, but but to that extent, I mean, it's you know, it truly creates a a, a donor class of politicians, and like that's just, I don't think that's what we want as American people, and and it's it's up, but it's up to voters in the end to decide. It's up to voters to see through that, and you know, I always encourage just go out and do your research. You know, just just do enough to go on the websites of each candidate and get a feel for who they are. Watch them watch their videos, see how they speak, see how they would represent you, see how they would articulate your values. You know, we put up YouTube videos all the time. You can always watch me in interviews. Um, you know, we're, we're coming or, or listen to podcasts, listen to Jocko's podcast. And, uh, you know, cause, cause you want people to get to know you and you need to be out there with folks. You need to be meeting people everywhere you go. And, and that's how we won. You know, that's how we built that connection with the voter. That's how we built momentum. Just getting out and meeting people and inspiring them and connecting with them. That's, that's, that still works. And we mm-hmm. proved that. That's one of the things that you did while your opponents were spending a bunch of money, you put on your uh, running shoes yeah, and yeah. ran through your entire district. Right. I did. Uh, I limped a lot of the way too. <laughs> Cause uh, <laughs> we talked about over preparing. Well, sometimes you can under prepare. <laughs> and uh, when you're running a campaign, there's not a lot of time to get your running in. And so I started that hundred mile run and um, it was going well, you know, so and I want to back up a little bit. We we planned this a while out. It was going to be five days, run across the whole district, really show that dedication. I want to I want to get on the ground. I want to show the dedication to every inch of this district. And um, with, with whatever publicity we get out of it, we're going to use it for a good cause. And we, we set up a GoFundMe account. It's still active if you want to donate to it. It's GoFundMe.com slash Rebuild Houston with Dan Crenshaw. And that money goes to three particular volunteer groups that I was able to identify and vet that are still out there every day rebuilding people's homes. Because that, I mean, that is still going on. I always try to let everybody know if you're a contractor, if you've got any expertise, please come volunteer in Houston. We are backed up to, you know, it is, it is tough to find a contractor these days. Even if people have the money to pay for it, they still can't get any availability. The demand is so high that the prices have gone way through the roof. We need more people there nationwide. So, you know, please come to Houston. There's work for you and there's good work. Um, and there's a lot left to do and people need it. So, and these volunteer groups are out doing it, you know, for five, $7,000, um, between five and $7,000, they can rebuild a whole home because all their labor is free, right? It's volunteers and they, and they do a great job and they're working in a lot of these neighborhoods where, where individuals just can't do it themselves. And it, it was, it was, a, it was just great to see that, um, a lot of church affiliated groups always out there helping. And, um, you know, it, it makes you proud to be a Texan, makes you proud to be an American. So we finished that run, you know, by, by day three, I was certainly limping through most of it. Um, you know, changed out my shoes day five or we're, we're running pretty well again, but, um, it was tough and it, but it was, it was fun. It was great. It was a great experience. You see people honking at you, maybe cause you're in their way, maybe because, <laughs> maybe because they're supporting you. I don't know. 
but uh, I mean, it was just it was it was pretty incredible experience to, uh, to see the supporters out there to see just you know just it was it was great. Um, we went and that was that was when early voting started. It was uh, we voted on day one of that run, and uh, and, and, and and you know two weeks later on election day we, we we wrapped it up and it was it was a good night. It was a we we're on pins and needles. It was until two a.m. that we knew that we'd actually come to, come into second place by one hundred and fifty five votes. Oh, so if you think anybody says their vote doesn't count, doesn't matter, that's wrong. It it truly matters. I mean, every single vote mattered. I can't thank every volunteer enough. Can't thank every supporter enough because a lot of people went out and they maybe got ten votes here and there, or maybe a hundred votes here and there. You know, individuals were able to do that and, and put us over the top because they believed in the message, they believed in our candidacy, and it was just, you know, it's humbling. It, and it's it's almost, you feel a weight of responsibility when people put their trust in you like that, as you should feel it, because you don't want to disappoint them. You know, you, you can't let your supporters down. And I truly feel that way about every vote. So what's, so what's next right now? Well... It's We're, the runoff. It's the runoff. It's just me and, and Kevin Roberts. And um, just, you know, it's May 22nd. Early voting starts again a couple of weeks before that. And it's a lot of the same. You know, we, we, we stick to the basics. We professionalize our organization. Uh, we ask for more money. Please donate at CrenshawForCongress.com. And, 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 and we... And we, we so that, move that's ahead. actually that's actually real though. Like you, you kind of you kind of joke about it, and I know you're like like most good human beings. You feel uncomfortable saying, "Hey, give me some money," but the reality is, for you to take this to the next level, that you need you need money. And and so when you say that kind of jokingly, that the reality is, if you don't get that money, it's going to be really hard to swing an upset. Right. And so so that's what's the what's the website. It's Crenshaw for Congress.com. C R E N S H A W F O R Congress.com. You can donate there. You can check out the candidacy there. You know, see our interviews, see our YouTube videos, our commercials, my bio, everything. It's all in one spot. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, we've got a pretty exciting social media presence. That's how we get a lot of our word out because, you know, it's cheap and it, it hits the right people. So Crenshaw for Congress.com. And, you know, that money, we spend it wisely. It, it doesn't go to anything silly. It's, you know, we, we need it to, to send mail to, to, to voters, you know, to get our message out. We need it to put out radio ads. We need it to buy T-shirts for volunteers and to buy yard signs so that people can put them in their yards and create that upwelling of support uh, where everybody's got a Dan Crenshaw sign. You know, that's that's how we do it. And um, it's, it's but it's we work our butts off. I promise you that we work for we work for every vote out there. And um, I, I truly believe that's how it should be. Um, and that's how it'd be in Congress. Yeah, that's awesome. And I know you're on a kind of a, a, a time schedule today, and I know you got some other things that you want to do here while you're out here in sunny, sunny San Diego, which isn't too sunny today. But I think we just hit everything of how people can best support your cause. And obviously, I'm in Crenshaw for Congress. On Twitter, you're Dan Crenshaw, Texas TX. Correct. So at Dan Cren Crenshaw TX. And then on Facebook, it's pretty easy to find you. Yeah. Uh, this is just Dan Crenshaw. Yeah, Dan and, Crenshaw for Congress. Yep. Or at Crenshaw for Congress. It's, it's yep. pretty easy. Yeah, I just searched Dan Crenshaw and you pop right up. So that's, uh, that's it. Well, you know, obviously, I, I just want to say before you take off, thanks for your service. Thanks, thanks for your sacrifice for this great country. Thanks for what you've done, for what you're doing, and thank you for what you are going to do. And yeah. appreciate everything. I appreciate that, Jocko. You know, the, the ser service isn't over. Um, you know, we, we find our purpose, we find our new mission, and, and this is it for me. You know, it's, it's helping Texans. It's given Texans a representative I think they can be proud of. We are so often just disgruntled and ashamed of our politicians, and we don't really think they're working on our behalf because we don't always elect people who truly put service before self. And and you know, part of this campaign is is convincing those that we do have a future, and we do have a future of leaders that will attract people to conservative values, and um, and keep those values alive. And 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 again, give us a leader that we can be proud of. Awesome. Well, I think they'll definitely find that with you. Thanks for coming on. And it's an honor to be here. Until you come back on once you get the W.
once you get the win, come back on and you can explain to us where you're going from there. Absolutely. Tell awesome. you how we did it. Get out and vote May 22nd, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Thank you. So, Dan has left the studio, yeah. but he's also left some very good ways to support him and what he's doing. And Echo Charles. Mm hmm. Speaking of support. Yeah. Maybe you could tell the troops how they can support this cause. Sure. <laughs> if they want. If. Of they course. Want. If they want. And and while they're supporting this cause, also support, support themselves. Support themselves. Which yeah. is important. If, if they want, you know. Did you, you hear what I just said? Yeah, very important. I said important. Yeah, you said it correct. Yeah. Two T's in that one. Yeah. For sure. Normally there's no T's in it for me. Important. Yeah. yeah. Important. Kind of like the British accent. Sometimes they don't say the T's too, and sometimes they say them really solid. Mm, you know? Interesting. Like they say, snap back to reality. They don't say reality. the T. Reality. Yeah. Or reality. When they say it. Interesting. Nonetheless, back to support. Yeah, if you want to support, support your joints. This is how you support your joints, if you don't know already. Jocko supplements. Good supplements. Krill oil, super krill, Jocko super krill oil, and joint warfare supplements for your joints. Maintain them. Also, discipline. Pre workout, pre mission, cognitive enhancer, plus physical enhancer. Force multiplier. Force, force multiplier. <laughs> yeah. There's layers. Yeah, actually. Fully. Yeah, you know, it's like a blend. It's a good blend. Yeah. Um, I am running low on the krill oil. I did not take my own advice for the, the subscription. Re subscription. Yeah. So I had to manually get some more. But hey, man, that's life sometimes. Uh, if you want to get on the subscription thing, re up every, what is it, month, right? Because it's a you month supply. You can pick. Yeah, 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 yeah. However much you take. And that's the smart way to do it. Totally is. Joint warfare, too. Yeah. Did you mention joint warfare? Yeah, fully. Yeah. It's the one. I think the combo is the best way to go, for sure. Recommend the combo. Nonetheless, you get them at originmain.com. Good way to support and support yourself. That's a big one. Also at originmain.com, there are geese and rash guards for your jujitsu journey. If you have chosen or will choose to go on that jujitsu journey. There's no reason why not. You should go on the jujitsu journey. Yeah, there's no and if you're going to ask, what if I'm small, big, large, Overweight, Older, underweight, younger, old, young. The answer is start jujitsu. Yeah. How do you get in shape for jujitsu? Jujitsu. Yeah. That's what you do. Yeah. You know, Tim, Tim always says like, oh, you know, Tim, he's been out of the jujitsu for a long time. Tim Ford. Yeah. Yeah. And he'll be Timbo. like, well, I gotta, yeah, I got to get back in shape to go. No. Right, you're looking at the wrong way, man. No. Yeah, you go back to jujitsu. The jujitsu gets you in shape. Yeah, you be you'll be fine. As You're far gonna as suffer. You, you can suffer a little bit, but might even suffer a lot. Eh, probably a lot. It's yeah. hard. Got to be hard mentally for a guy like Timbo because he's a purple belt. Yeah, and so he's gonna come and get beat by some white belts. I mean, not white belts, by some blue belts. Yeah, some and blue belts because you know some blue belts they bring it. Yeah, and they keep and they can belt. keep bringing and it, they especially if, they, if they've been in there. They got yeah. the kadish. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so Tim would be like, "Come back," and then, and it adds that level of anxiety because you know when you feel yourself gas. Well, you probably don't know this, but if you feel yourself gassing and you're like, "Shoot, I knew I was gonna gas." Now you're really gassing. Now that the anxiety mm. goes up, and you gas some more. Is that how it is? He'd want to avoid all that stuff. That's what I think. But you know, that's when you put all these weird expectations on yourself. That's my opinion in the jujitsu. So just go into jujitsu and learn jujitsu, and when you do. You're going to want a gi if you do gi because you can do no gi as well. But when you choose a gi, I recommend. You recommend? I think there's only one recommendation. I agree. In all seriousness, there's only one recommendation. Yeah. And I've been through a lot of gis. I have a lot of Me gi too. experience. Yeah. We'll say a significant amount of gi experience. And the origin gi has proven legitimately to be the best one kind of by far too. Yeah. There's this one that I used to use it's, that, that was good, it was fine, and it was like good. Yeah, there's a difference though. There's a difference between oh, this gi's good, yeah. and then you get an orange and gi, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny, like you know how like when you get a new gi in Rash Guard or whatever, and you're kind of fired up to go train because you got your new gi. Oh, like I the new this, kid with the new shoes. Yeah, you know, it's that. I it's can that, run faster. That 
feeling didn't wear off like for a while. Did you feel that like when we rolled, when we were both wearing yeah. new origin yeah, keys? I did. Were you fired up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause it's like, yeah. Did you think maybe it was going to be the day? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for the record, I always think. Do you it's always gonna think be, it's going to be the day? Always, yeah. yeah. Dang. Because maybe one day there will you know be the day. I always think it's going to be the day, too. Maybe it's not, though. Maybe it will. I don't know. Could be the day. Yeah. Jack. Anyway, originmain.com. Get your gi there when you choose to get a gi. There's compression gear, too. Rash guards. If you do no gi, there's rash guards there, too. All yeah. made in America. Yeah, I was going to say, all made in America. Yeah. Which is. We're, like it's no big deal. No, it's a huge deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal yeah. made in America yeah. in Maine in our factory By awesome workers and it's not the kind where by crafts crafts people crafts craftsmen crafts person crafts people because people man they're, Some of them are females. Yeah, but they're craftsmen. Yeah men doesn't mean you're a man. It means yeah. you're a human Yeah, as far as I know like Modern man, like mankind. Yeah, mankind. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Right? So, so crafts mankind, crafts mankind. <sighs> Nonetheless, all made in America. Yes, and that is a big deal. And it's not the kind where it's like, yeah, let's import all our things or whatever, and then we'll quote unquote make it in America, where you you tick the one check box that it's like, yeah, technically it's made. In, it's not that yeah, kind. No. It's the kind where they grow the cotton in America. They. What do they do after they grow the cotton? They harvest. They, they, they harvest the cotton. They, 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 loom. they well, they loom. dye the cotton. Then they weave the cotton. Then, yeah, yeah. There's a whole bunch of steps. All done in America. Yeah, yeah. blend the cotton because it's not just cotton. Yeah, it's yeah. an athletic. That's one of the problems with the old geese. They're all made just with with cotton. They're yeah. like like crap. Yeah. And then why would you not get modern technology? Well, why? Because they don't have. They don't do jujitsu where they're making the geese. Yeah. Now. So like little issues that come up in jujitsu, just little ones mm -hmm. or big ones or whatever when they come up in jujitsu. I'll tell you what's cool. You know. put it. You put a origin gi in the dryer. It's dry like quick. Yeah, yeah. And because it's not all cotton. Yeah. Because if you remember in the teams, cotton kills. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Cotton, cotton kills because it gets wet and then it's heavy and makes you cold. Jams you up. Yeah, it doesn't dry quick enough. Yeah. Get the blend going. Yeah. Then you're good to go. And there's all kinds of different weaves too, which is cool. Then let's go to originmain.com. You can check out which, whichever one you want. Hey, if you want something, get something. Also, what you want to do is go to the immersion camp if you want. So Jujitsu Immersion Camp, it's not like a training camp for ADCC. No. It's an educational experience. Yeah, it's like you immerse yourself in. That you can modulate to the level of your personal commitment to getting after it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So some people will be there and they're gonna be really sore every day because yeah. they're gonna be getting after it hard. Some people are gonna be brain, their brain's gonna be more sore than their body because they're gonna be more looking at it from the education that they're gonna need of learning new moves and techniques. Yeah. So that's what's cool about the, the immersion camp. Or some of us, nothing's gonna be sore because Maybe it'll be sore for a little while, and then we're just going to cruise a little bit, exercise the brain more, and then the body, you know, yeah, go back and forth. Do whatever yeah. you like. Yeah, and there's a lot to go around. And it's kind of fun, too. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's cool to hang out with just a bunch of people that are going to do jiu-jitsu for yeah. seven days. Yeah, and then, then they get, like, five tons of lobster. And you don't have to stay there the whole time. Yeah, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a first part and a second part. You know, it's like the first few days, and then you can do this, the second few days, and then you can do all of them if you want. So... August 26th through September 2nd. Yeah. We're going to be there. You know who else yeah. is going? No big deal. Dave Burke. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Dave Burke's Burke. got the bug. Do you yeah. know that? Oh, yeah. No, he's got the bug. Yeah, he'll call me for just like verbal advice. Sometimes. Oh, he's, he, he be texting me about uh about like guard passing. Yeah, yeah, yeah like you know? positions. I'm yeah, like, yeah. oh, really? <laughs> hey, let's do it. Yeah, let's communicate yeah. about guard passing via text. Yeah. Hey, Amen. You know what he's he catching people it. with? Wow. Americana. Yeah, and it's good. It's an interesting conversation because you know he says, "Oh, well, the Americana is like what I use the most right now," mm -hmm. and and I told him like the Americana is actually not a really effective move, yeah. right, against anyone that has trained for a little bit. Right, P purple belt, you're not gonna. You might catch an, a blue belt in an Americana. Mm -hmm. Purple belt, probably not gonna happen. I did catch a black belt in Americana the other day, and and it was like shame. 
You know? Right, like oh, I got caught with America. Yeah, and he, and this this particular black belt was like shame. He yeah. he hung his head in shame. He was like, he goes Americana. Yeah, but I explained to Dave the the reason that the Americana is effective for him right now, the most effective. I'm like, is it the first submission that you learned? Yes, it is. Yeah. So he's practiced it the most, and he's figured out all the little nuanced things that you have yes. to do right in order to make the a move a move work and the, the Americana work yep. so he's figured out some of those things because he's tried it a bunch even when he missed it he learned something yeah. he didn't even know he learned something but he learned something yeah. so he keeps trying and it, he got good with the, so he's good at the Americana yep. he's not going against people that know how to defend it yet which is going to be a problematic so you got it you got to yep. that's what happens but isn't that part of the whole learning process though cuz that yes same thing i mean remember when uh, i mean i'm assuming you had similar experience where yeah you sure. you you'd do americanas and you'd get them uh, oh, and then I after did a while, certain moves for years like yeah. like like for when i first started my first good move was the ezekiel gotcha. in fact yeah. i used to call it the easy kill the easy kill the yeah easy kill. that's what i thought it was that was one called. of but it, it was i learned it like one of the first submissions I and then I just tried it all the time and I got yeah. pretty good at it. But yeah. then you realize that it's not that hard to defend the Ezekiel. Eventually, when you start going against better guys, so then you got to move to the. I think the next move that I actually started doing a lot of was the Kimura, and I spent a couple of years at Kimura, and then I started, spent a couple of years at Crucifix, then I spent a couple of years at the Straight Foot Lock, then you know so, and yeah, uh, you know just getting evolution. good at those positions. Yeah, that's how. But Dave Burke, back to my point, he's coming. He's yeah. coming to the the camp. Yeah. And you know who else is? Oh, we'll see who else is going to come. We'll see if we'll see if Leif. Yeah, I don't should. know if you know. We all have to work. Sure. Yeah. I we, blocked this off though. Yeah, yeah. Which is sweet. Yeah, it's really good fun. So yeah. Cool. Go, man. If you can make that, make that. Uh, what's the date on them again? August twenty sixth through 26th. September second. Oh yeah, and if you want to, if you do want to come, you can go to originmain.com and you go to Emergent Camp and you can sign up. Yeah. You can come and hang out. It's a good Eat one. lobster if you like lobster. Eat yeah. Steak if you like if you lobster. Like steak. Yeah, hang out in Maine, yeah. visit our factory. Yeah, which is awesome. <laughs> I think you can go like paddling, stand up paddling, stand up stuff paddle boarding like, and good. stuff. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Also, good way to support yourself if you choose to vary up your workout, make it a little less boring. You always make it sound like I do these boring workouts, yeah. and I just realized I've been hard. taking that abuse for for quite some time. Cool. My workouts are not boring. Oh, yeah, in they're, fact, they're boring and and hard. So they're hard. Yeah. So here's the thing, where what boring is like just a complete matter of opinion, you know. So, to me, if you're gonna do twenty rep squats, Bruh. rest twenty reps, rest twenty reps until you're like, that's d- kind of boring. And have you ever done it before? Yes. You've done that workout. Not your exact See? one, but yeah, I did do 20 rep squats. Some, in fact, have yeah. you ever done 20 rep squats that you can only squat 10 times? Well, that's physically impossible, but. No. <laughs> yes, it is. If you can only do it 10 times, you can only do it 10 times. No. If you can do it 20 times, you can do it 20 times. No. That's it. That's no. not how it works. No. Nope. All right, Brett. Hey, look. Take my word for it. You can dude. physically do it 10 times. Mentally, you do it 20 times. Oh, okay. And you do it So you times. imagine you do it 20 times. Okay, so look. If you can <laughs> physically do it 10 times, that, I guess technically you're right. And Thank I don't want to, listen, I don't want to split hairs, but you're still not right. If you can do it 10 times, but you can do it 20 times, because look, if you can do something 20 times, you can do it 10 times. So yes, but what you're saying is something that you... F- you know, max out at 10 times. The weight you use to max out at 10 times. You do it 20 times. Physically impossible. Mentally impossible, max. apparently for Echo. Oh, man. See, anyway, back to the workouts. Man, maybe that's where them skinny knees come from. <laughs> <laughs> no, bro. Maybe. No. Maybe. No. Maybe. Anyway, <laughs> if you want to vary up the workout, go to onit.com slash Jocko. Get some cool kettlebells. Yeah. Get some battle ropes, get a mace, get two maces, a heavier one and a lighter one. Boom. Formulate See, I a more interesting. I use them. So my, my workouts are interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. You have an interesting workout. Well, do it that way. That's what I, that's what I would, would, what do you say? Suggest. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. On it. Right. com. Good stuff in there. Um, don't get addicted to the website because there's a lot of good information too on there. 
because you could nonetheless also good way to support when you get the books that Jocko sometimes reviews on this podcast. I organize or we organize them on JockoPodcast.com. Click on the top says books from the from the episode. I got all the books listed there. Including little articles that you know how sometimes you'll cover an article. I'll list those on there too. How much research would you have to do if you knew nothing about this podcast or me? How much research would you have to do to figure out that we read books? on the podcast and that they're all on jockopodcast.com. The reason I ask this is because I've had I've had people ask me on social media like a week ago, mm. like on Twitter like, "Do you like to read?" Yeah. Right? Like yeah. that's a cra- for, you don't have to dig very deep right, right. to to know that answer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Do you like to read? Mm-hmm. Right? That this is a really low level question that doesn't take a whole lot of research to figure out yeah right yeah i guess is that laziness or is it like hey this guy seems pretty accessible i'm just gonna ask him here he is i wonder if this guy likes to read i don't think the likelihood of it being laziness because obviously it's gonna be different for different people but the 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 likelihood of it being laziness is pretty low i think i don't think it's lazy laziness at all i think it would be a mix or one of these things yeah, they just want to ask you a question that that you know that you're gonna have an answer to. Yeah, or yeah. or maybe they're just new, or maybe they know you from Extreme Ownership, and you know I know you wrote this cool book. Hey, do you like to read in general? Kind of thing. Yeah. Maybe they okay. don't listen to your. You so know, I'm being too harsh, being too judgmental on my yeah, part. If you're if you're jumping to that conclusion that it's laziness yeah. or a dumb question, do you like then, to read? Yeah. Like we literally have a podcast about books that we read. Yeah. And and then people say, "Do you have a list of books? Do you rec- do you have any books you recommend?" Yeah. "Do you have a book list? Yeah. Do you have a reading list?" These are all things I get asked on a regular basis. Is is this kind of like the time I ask you, "Hey, do you know any, of any gun ranges?" And you <laughs> said, "Yeah, Google, go on Google and search gun ra- ranges." Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. guess so. Yeah, I, I feel the same tone okay. here's the thing you never really know uh, when people are coming in the game you don't know what you yeah. know what their deal is or where they're coming from so yeah like maybe or maybe maybe they just heard you on tim ferris or joe rogan mm-hmm. and was like boom this guy's super interesting let me go straight to him and start talking to him yeah. kind of thing or start asking questions yeah. rather than going on the internet let me research who this guy is and what uh, he likes okay. and doesn't like to do etc etc et am et cetera. i am i lazy in the fact that when I want to know something, I'll Google it. No, that's not easy. Okay. I don't, yeah, no, that's not easy. I don't think so. All right. As opposed to what? I don't know. Saying. Going to school and studying well, it first. No, I guess that's another I guess that would thing. be the, you know, the alternative. Nonetheless, if you are feeling not lazy, actually, this has nothing to do with laziness because this is more a convenience that I think would be benefit or I thought would be beneficial for people who are looking for the books that you cover okay. and ways to get them. That's why I organize these books on talkpodcast.com. Yeah. The website. They're, so yeah, they're all there. They're all there by episode. And, and by chance they're kind of in order of preference, in order of the way you almost the way you should read them. Maybe I'd have to shift some of them now. Yeah. I should put them in a different order because there's some books that I read again. I was like, man, I, this should be at the, this should be near the top. I mean about faces is the number is number one. Yeah. Right? You should read that book first. Yeah. People ask me that all the time. Well, what? You, what's you, your favorite book? I've already read Extreme Ownership. Is there another book you recommend I read? Well, and I've read all your books. Yeah. What book should I read next? About Face by Colonel David Hackworth. Yeah, that's like your main I, one. Yeah. So anyways. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, I organize them by episode. Yeah, so yeah. So the no, most but, recent episode right, with book. But if you go back to episode one, which there's no book, but two, there's a book. And if you go in that order of reading, that's a good progression to get oh, okay. through the books properly. I understand what you Gotcha. So if you st- if you if you want to read your book, Jocko's book list in order of importance, in order of importance, you go in chronological order per podcast. Yes, with books. That's way, recommended. Because not all podcasts have books. That's Side recommended. Note. Cool. Well, there it is. Again, just click on the books and boom, it takes you there. Boom, click through there, get your book. Easy way, to, good way to support. It takes you to Amazon. All good. Continue shopping if you feel the need to. Like if you're shopping for Valentine's Day. No, that already passed. What's the next one? Easter. Mm. Carry on. Easter gifts. Sure. 
good. Those chocolate Easter bunnies and the and the eggs. You know how you you, you go Easter egg hunting, right? No. Yeah. 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 Hell yeah. Well, my kids do. Sure. Well, my youngest kid does. Yeah. There you go. My so other if you kids shop for that don't country. care. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. You know, they're older. After a while, you kind of figure it out. Kind of. Mm. Still fun, though. Can be. Nonetheless, click through. That's a good way to support. Also, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Uh, leave a review. If you're in the mood, leave a review. Here's the thing. I'm not saying, hey, leave a review. I'm not saying to leave a review. But I think sometimes people, they want to leave a review, but they don't, like, think about it, you know? Mm. And then one... Let's say I get reminded, like, oh, shoot, I want to leave a review. And I get reminded, I'm like, boom, then I'm going to go leave a review. That's a good one. I read all the reviews. Yeah. And I've read them on the podcast before when they're really funny, or I've quoted them on social media. Yeah. yeah. So there's that, too. Yeah. Yeah. If you write an awesome review, yeah. well, it doesn't have to be awesome, but if it's funny or it's yeah. good or it's uh, creative, let's uh, that's what I should have said. If yeah. it's a creative uh, review, yeah. There's been some really good ones. Yeah. Same thing with uh, Amazon reviews for tea and books and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people that get after it. They get colorful <laughs> for sure. I don't say colorful. They put la- the main thing is layers. layers. They put a lot of layers in yeah. there. So, yeah. Probably some people are real good at the layers. Mm-hmm. Very impressed with that on many levels. See what I did. <laughs> <laughs> see what you did. Nonetheless, yeah, subscribe good. if you uh, you know if you want to support that way. That's a good way. Thanks for the people who have subscribed. That's 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 a good. Good deal. It's much appreciated. Big deal. Also on YouTube, subscribe to that if you want. If you like the video version of this podcast or if you want to watch and or share excerpts of this podcast. Three minutes, one minute sometimes. You haven't made any one minute ones. Six minutes sometimes. You should make some one minute ones. Okay. That'd be good. The one you just made is good. Thanks. The... Time, time is running, running out. out. Yeah, that's like a, what do you call it? Did we, we settle on enhanced? Enhanced. Like enhanced. I think it's called enhanced. Excerpt. Enhanced excerpts, which means that Echo has gone and put his cinematic flair. No, I would say I put some music on it and I put some text on it. There and it is. Some Boom. Cinematic Just enhance. It's enhanced a little bit. That's some all. Cinematic flair there. Yeah. All right. Well, there it is. There's some of those on but there. That you video know, as well. By the way, no yeah. big deal. I, I When I got to the gym today, Carl, he's Carl like, Santiago. hey. Yeah. Carl. He says, hey, I saw you on World Star. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know yeah, you made it. We made yeah, it. Straight up. Yeah. Popular culture. Yeah. Popular culture. We're on World Star. World Star. <laughs> if you don't know what World Star is, it yeah. originally was for fights. That's you know- what I knew it for. Yeah, that's how it. I think that's how it gained. Yeah, I think it, it, was it was just for scraps. Like, it was for it was for like music videos. I think oh, okay. hip hop music videos and stuff like that. Then you get you know well, other I used stuff. To, I would watch it because they because people would film street fights and yeah, I like yeah. to watch street fights. Sure, you can learn a lot from street fights. Yeah. And what's funny is it became such a popular culture thing that when people would be recording the fights that they're gonna <laughs> then put on World Star, they would be saying World Star. World Star. Yeah. During the fight. Someone be filming and saying, World Star, this is going on World Star. Yeah. Well, now guess what's on World Star? Echo's video. <laughs> we made it. Jocko's on World Star. <laughs> World Star. Dang. That's good. Nonetheless, cross if, cultural boundaries. Yeah. Hey, World Star. World Star. Make it sure. happen. Yeah, you did. 100%. <laughs> uh, but yeah, YouTube, you know, subscribe to, all to that. All people good at World Star, thanks for putting me on there. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> that is good. Awesome. So yeah, YouTube. Good one, good way to support. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store, obviously. JockoStore.com, obviously. That's where you can get shirts, T-shirts, some travel mugs on there, some rash guards, more rash guards. This is like Jocko gear rash guards. So compared to, how would you compare them to the Origin? Because actually- They're made they're by real, Origin. Yeah, they're similar. They're, they're you know, it's kind of They're more like geared toward like, toward like Jocko well, the let's, path. Yeah, let's say this, that from a from a visual perspective, there's a way that Jocko gear looks mm-hmm. and there's a way that Origin gear looks. Yeah. There's some areas that overlap. Mm-hmm. There's some areas that don't overlap. Don't overlap yeah. Some of the, let's call them color combinations <laughs> that my brother Pete Roberts puts together, yeah. they wouldn't be allowed in the Jocko store. Yeah. Uh, they not, wouldn't yeah, be Jocko allowed. gear. Correct. And there's some things that Jocko Gear does that wouldn't be appropriate for Origin because Origin is a little bit in the other direction. 
Sure. Yeah. The overlapping areas, all good. Yeah. But if you want your gear made in America, there's one place to get it done right. Yep. That's our factory up in Maine. True story. So yeah, boom, you can get rash guards there as well. Uh, some patches. Those are restocked. A lot of people were hitting me up. That's why for patches. Yeah. It's weird that people have to hit you up that you just don't pay attention to the stock and say, yeah. well, l- yeah. running low, I should order more. Yeah. Yeah. I, Maybe I it's have... not that important to you. No, no, no. It's important. So I got a handle on it and I think I have a solid system where, you know, we're going to run into way less of that, if any, of that okay. type well, that's of situation. Good to hear. Unless some women's stuff on there, some hats Because it there. does mean a lot to me. Yeah. Just, I'm saying. That's cool. So maybe I should be more, I, I should do a better job of expressing how important it is to me for people if they want patches to be able to get one. Yeah. Maybe I haven't, I, I obviously haven't done a good job. Yeah, it's your fault. That. It's yeah, your fault. It is. So yeah, DracoStore.com. That's a good, good, good way to support. Also, Psychological Warfare. If you don't know what that is, that's an album. An album. Not a music album. It's a... it's a Spoken job. word. Spoken word. With tracks. Jocko tracks. And each track is designated, formulated, engineered. It's engineered is what it is. To help you through little points of weakness that you might run into on your campaign against weakness. Like if yeah. you want to skip... I, I always say... If you want to skip the workout, if you're like, hey, I'm too tired. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. I start with that one because that's essentially why this whole thing exists. <laughs> because that, that was the issue. That like, was the feel- genesis of this album. Yeah. Was Echo questioning how he could overcome these moments of weakness. Or how I do. And then I kind of answered one of them. And he said, we should record those things. Yeah. You know what's funny is that I asked you that before and it wasn't that specific question but it was mm. essentially that question yeah. and be like hey what do you do and then you look, you kind of gave me a look and more like as if your feelings don't matter kind of thing and you basically pulled the jock and was like doesn't matter if you I feel like it or not I got asked this the other thing. day I got asked this is similar you know someone said hey can you tell us a little bit more about your morning routine like what you like so you know you can I know you get up early but can you tell us more about your morning routine I was like yeah listen my morning sure. routine is extremely, extremely important. Yeah. So here's here's the steps of the Jocko morning routine. First of all, you set your alarm clock. You set all your alarm clocks. You set the first one at 4.30. You set the next one at 4.35. You set the next one at 4.40. And you have your backups. Mm. By the way, you don't set your backups at the same time because you don't want to be fumbling around with three alarm clocks in the yeah. morning. It's a good tip. Good tip. Then you get done with that. Then when the alarm clock goes off, you get up, you get out of bed, then you go, and it's important that you get your toothbrush out. And then I brush, and then I use 46 brush strokes on each side of my mouth, and no more, no less. And then I spit three times into this. So, yeah. I'm like, That's oh, the, here's the morning yeah. routine, dude. You get up and you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, morning then again. Routine. No, I know. Right, I know. You're being, yeah. I know, but it's like re- the reality is. Is someone going to write down my morning routine and then follow the exact same thing? And would that be good for him? Maybe. I don't know. Well, he hears the morning routine then. Get up and go. Get up and get yeah. after it. Yeah. But here's the, like some people, they, they, they focus on, and, and this can be beneficial from, from what I hear. They focus on or they identify certain things they do in a morning routine that helps them, that like yeah. sets them up mentally no, I'm not or whatever. anti morning routine. And I've, I actually wrote about in the, in the, in the field manual. It's like uh, more, the, the morning routine starts the night before. Yeah, yeah. The morning routine starts when you get your gear ready because you don't want to be fumbling around in the morning. Don't wake, don't set yourself up to fumble around with things in the morning, yeah. right? That's just sure. a bad thing. Don't no. do that. Yeah. So you you know, you have your gear ready. You know, for me, I'm, I'm very systematic in pretty much yeah. <laughs> the See way I I'm roll. Saying? Yeah, exactly. And, but you, you know, I have like all my workout gear is in the bathroom on hangers. You know, pair of shorts, yeah. shirt on each hanger. There's yeah. like six of them. They're all the same. There's no thought process that's needed. Yeah. They're all matching. Yeah. And I have the same kind of socks all my socks are the same i do have black socks and white socks but the one drawer is just yeah. completely white socks all the same mm-hmm. you you grab those you put those on boom you brush your teeth boom you take i take my supplements in the morning and and at night but i take my my krill oil and my my joint warfare boom 
and then I go hit it. How much water do you drink? It's it's I drink when I'm thirsty. I drink, and then if I'm I, I don't okay. measure it. Yeah. So you don't be like okay. No. I'm Mix. Not, it. Uh, yeah, I dig it. I drink when I'm thirsty. I eat when I'm hungry. But if you drink water when you're thirsty, you're already two percent dehydrated. Okay. Well, I drink That's a little bit thing. more. I drink about three percent more than. <laughs> all right there you go so you're one percent uh over over hydrated or hydrated yeah. within no less uh but well you know how like i'll drink a whole thing like you know the mugs that we have yeah. the travel they're 30 ounces by the way mm-hmm. i'll drink a whole thing of that just routine that's kind of the routine but what like it, in the morning yeah you, like, you pound it sure if you want to call it pounding why do you do that drink it because you want to stay hydrated yeah but get the water back in there man get get it Get it oh, okay. In. That's Maybe all. It's good for that. you. Water is good for you, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. It's better than soda in the morning. You ever drink a Coke in the morning? No. Bro, it's like, it's hey, the worst. We, we did these monster mashes in the, back in the derm. <laughs> and so my son was doing a monster mash with us when he was like six or Wait, seven what's years a, old. What's a monster mash is like, yo, you do rope climbs, then you do a sprint, then oh, you okay. do like Work a out. swim, gotcha. and then you do pull ups, and then you. And they put little, little things in there sometimes. Mm. So one of the things that, that they had to do was uh, drink a Coke through a straw. Yeah. So you're like doing pull-ups and a rope climb, and then yeah, they got you, a Coke. You, you told me and, this. Yeah, and so he, uh, he, he, I think that was the first time he ever tried soda. Yeah. And he's like, Bleh. Yeah, you yeah, can't do it that. It was nasty. It's, well, there's, it's Cured nasty. him of wanting soda, though. Yeah, the way... W- the, there's two elements to drinking a soda, especially for the first time. Is okay, it tastes S- weird. Sweet, sugary, and carbonated. Yeah, the yeah. carbonated All will burn things. your mouth. It feels like it's burning your mouth. Yeah, he so, didn't like it. Yeah, you can't do that. Little to kid. kid, it's messed up right in the middle of the workout too. Check. Don't do that. Uh, well, but you, you keep in mind, you just described your morning routine. You yeah, answered yeah. the no, question I, that they were a- I, I asking. Know, you I just know. answered and it. That's why I said, look, I'm not trying to be negative against morning routines. Yeah, and there's pretty much what I do, but the the reason. Is I think people think, oh, if I have, if I knew your morning routine, then I'd know what the secret is. Yeah, it's like, yeah. hey, That's man, all, the yeah. secret is get up and go do something. Yeah, That's yeah. the secret. Yeah. I'm not going to, se- here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm not going to sell you my morning routine as yeah. the solution to your problems. Now, I will say that if you fumble around in the morning, it's going to cause you problems throughout the day. So don't fumble around in the morning. Set your, set your life up correctly so that you're not fumbling around. That's good. I'm not going to sell you my morning routine as a solution to your problems. Yes, I'm not going to do that. But I will say that if you do have a good system that you go through Mm -hmm. in the morning, it will set up your day correctly. Yeah. That's why I think people ask. That's why people want it. And I get it. Okay. So I'm not trying to be like a jerk, right? I'm not trying to be that negative. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm kind of making fun of morning. Yeah, you're making fun. I'm making fun of morning routines a little bit, but at the same time, I have one and I, and I stick to it. Yeah. But I think that's the thing. That's the thing. That's the thing. I don't, I don't actually have something and I stick to it. Like I do. This is what it is. I follow the functional thing that works. And you stick to it. Yeah, and I stick to it. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do. I didn't like design my morning routine, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't say oh, I'm going to design this perfect routine. No, it's like I know what works. Yeah. It's functional, and that's what I do. Yeah. I do things that work. Yeah, man. And everyone else wants to know what works. Okay, well, because not have everyone it. figured out on their own what works. I guess so here's it, the thing: your morning routine. You're you're ultimately right, and I think this is bit super important not to forget or not to like miss interpret where you know you just uh the quote you just said like your morning routine is not going to be the solution to your problems kind right, of thing right. i think that's what people do think i think that that here someone with a level head in my opinion i don't i don't know but this is what it seems like where someone with a level head and they want to look for just that just just that one um thing that's going to help them just a little bit yeah. you know so they're gonna be like hey let me let me formulate a good morning routine i don't know that much about effective routine so let me look into that yep. just as a little helper not the solution to my problems which i think some people yeah. may kind of miss no you know. uh, you're right and that's why like i said i'm not belittling the idea that a morning routine is helpful because it certainly is yeah it might add some some tiny bit of help to your day yeah, some if you're doing the right thing yeah. some benefits thank you Mm. It might benefit your day, which is positive. Will it cure your overall problems of life? No, but you know what? It's a good place to start. Mm. That's why we say wake up early, right? Yeah, that's part of the part routine of the part right of the there. routine. So yeah, but even how you—I guess I am being a jerk. 
Yeah, but here's the thing. This so is what yes, it seems like. Let me, after let me we just, kinda... let me just like, like, yeah, get on a good morning routine. That's a good idea. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not trying to make fun of it. I, I was, but I'm not anymore. It seems like you're making fun of it for people because this is what it maybe sounded like when someone asked you, what's your morning routine? It sounds like you, you're kind of with this presumption, like you're presuming or assuming that they think it's going to solve all their problems. Yeah, That's so, kind of what so it I am sounded being a jerk, like. Yeah. Yes, but in that very specific direction. Yeah, like right. if someone says, hey, look, I'm always looking for things to benefit my day and my effectiveness. You know, I've, I've, you know, I do this and do that. And I found that this even helps a little bit here and there. Hey, what's your morning routine? Maybe I can incorporate one or more things oh, yeah, of your routine be, yeah. maybe into mine. Right. That'll give me a little bit of help too. I don't think you would have came no, off like definitely. that. You know? Definitely. That would have so, been a very good question. Yeah. I would say, oh yeah, here's what I do. Yeah. So there you go. So even how you... My, said the question like yeah. you were kind of impersonating yeah, the, the, the hypothetical yeah. person you're like what's your morning routine like yeah. making them sound I all dorky yes yeah, sorry 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 everyone no no it's all good person. it's all good we got you know, to the bottom of it speaking of you drinking water another drink you can drink is you can drink something called Jocko White Tea sure it's available on Amazon now this is the only tea available not only in America but in the world that comes with an 8,000 pound deadlift guarantee. <laughs> yeah. you know, so there's no other tea. I, I never there's seen some one. out there that are, that are they, they say 6,000. They say they can get you a 6,000 pound deadlift. Yeah. Mm. There's, I've seen, I've seen 7,200, <laughs> right? Sure. 72, yeah, did you yeah. see this? 72, some teas, some, some white teas say they'll get you 7,200. Mm. There's only one white tea that'll get you the guaranteed 8,000 pound deadlift. Good. There's some layers on the tea, which I kind of remembered last time, but I didn't want to inter- interrupt you. You, um, you talking is first episode of this podcast, absolute first one. Oh yeah, I think the only one that doesn't start with this is yeah. Jocko Podcast. That's because you had a different vision of the podcast <laughs> at the time. With no, we yeah. Nonetheless, it started with you were oh, thinking. You were thinking this podcast is gonna be a hundred percent cruising. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it felt like that first one that's what it felt like yeah like no we're, in your mind yeah in yeah, my mind right. and if you listen yeah now you were you could see yeah, i was not right. i was not ready to cruise yeah i came in there with a game plan yeah and the game plan did not say cruise on it <laughs> <laughs> the game plan said get after well, it what was funny is you shut it down so quick right when you heard it you were like hey uh, you know you want to cut it at this point not the not the the uh, little con- like we just rolled into a conversation yeah but here's the thing with that conversation as far as the layers go we talk about white tea. Yeah, you called like, it chai. Yeah, no, because I was trying to remember what kind of tea that was. I don't know about the tea, especially back then. Nonetheless, uh, you were always on the pomegranate. Yeah, white. That, that started when I was in the dirt. Oh, bro, yeah. that's all. So, anyways, you can get that. You can get it on Amazon, and then you can start deadlifting properly. Yeah. Uh, there's some books that you can get. Way of the Warrior Kid. I get questions all the time about how you should raise your kids mm. and, and 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 not just how to raise them because I think people know how to raise them but they're but they not how to raise them but how to raise them like they know what they want the kids to they know the values that they want the kids to have but they're not yeah. sure how to give them the values yeah, right yeah. they don't know how to do that so it real simple get them this book way of the warrior kid that that's you know discipline eating habits working out dealing with bullies how to study all those things are in there these are the things you want not just your kid, but the children of the world to have these type of qualities. And now, on top of that, we have Way of the Warrior Kid 2, which is called Mark's Mission. This talks about some important lessons, controlling your temper, Mm -hmm. overcoming fear of failure, working hard, saving money, being frugal, dealing with verbal abuse, helping other people, Starting businesses, yeah, I said that, yeah, and becoming a leader. Again, all the there's no human being that would look at the lessons from Way of the Warrior Kid and say would say I don't want my kid to have that yeah. quality. No, the qualities are in there. Yeah. So there's that. And if you want a good example of a warrior kid, check out IrishOaksRanch.com, where you can get soap that's handmade by young Aiden who's 12 years old but he has a business no big deal he's making soap yeah was well, interesting goat milk soap yeah that soap's actually good like f- to use so, oh for sure let's face it 
you know how you have your friend and you oh. know his wife makes oh, soap this is on a the sympathy weekend. Purchase, you, sympathy purchase scenario. Yeah, you know, and you so no, you got some, and it's purchase beautiful. Scenario. It has the little uh, packaging, and then you say, "All right, it's soap. Um, let me go ahead and use some soap." And you're like, "Bro, this isn't like usable soap. This is a novelty decorative item." It was a cool little educational experience because he asked me. You know, he was making soap, and he's and he reached out to me. His dad is. Uh, uh, a farmer also a firefighter but he's a farmer anyways his dad and I were connected I buy meat from his dad and you know he said oh my son wants to get in touch with you but so as we're going through the process he sends me like his label for the soap yeah and you know it looked nice but I'm um, went back with you know this is, needs to be in OCR awesome. standard yeah <laughs> so anyways Central. yeah it's a cool little learning process and yeah you can get that soap you can support a kid that's a warrior kid and the Jocko Soap motto, which I give Aiden no credit for. <laughs> Sorry, Sweet. Aiden. Yeah, You're a good kid, but you didn't think of this. It took the it took the masterful marketing <laughs> mind of Jocko to come up with the motto for Jocko Soap, which is stay clean. It's good. And you know there's some layers on that too, right? Uh, yeah, I guess. Motor, What's the layers? Motorhead song. Oh, all right. There you go. And you like Motorhead. And I am a huge fan of Motorhead. And you don't do any drugs, so there's there, kind of and there's that. the reason that whenever I talk to people or people talk to me on the, uh, through social media or email and they've had a drug problem or an alcohol problem and I always kind of sign off like, hey, stay clean. Dang. Stay clean. So, Because okay. that's also what Lemmy from Motorhead was saying. Stay clean. Like, Don't yeah. let this kill you. Now, that's Lemmy from Motorhead was a rare dude who did a lot of drugs and alcohol and somehow was able to survive very well up to up to when he died drinking incredible amounts of Jack Daniels Dang. yeah those are some legit layers like, but he ne- always would say don't do it yeah he's a guy that would say don't do it it's don't, don't do it don't do what people do don't do drugs yeah stay clean stay clean there you go uh, in addition to that got another book called the discipline equals freedom field manual and if this is this is a good point if you know someone that's off the path right like people go off the path in life and it doesn't take we talked about this last time it doesn't take but one step off the path when you're on a slippery slope yeah it's a slippery slope when you step off the path so if you know someone that has taken a step off the path and they're starting to slide down Get them this book to get them on the path, the right path. And there's also a chance that the person that stepped off the path is you. So get the field manual. It's got the thoughts and actions that are required to be on the right path. Make yourself better, faster, stronger, smarter. Anything else? more physically fit and healthier Mm -hmm. the audio version of that is on itunes amazon music google play other mp3 platforms it's not on audible because then you can't have it as an album with tracks which we obviously support extreme ownership the first book i wrote with my brother leif babin over a million copies sold that's a lot of copies sold yes sir that's a lot of copies sold you know how many copies they told us would be successful because we didn't know any, Leif and I didn't know anything about the publishing world. Wait, what do you mean? It, when we the, were getting, when the book was getting ready to come out, and I would talk to the, we were talking to the publisher, Leif and I were talking to the publisher, and he says, you know, if this is a, a successful book, then, you know, it'll, it'll really be, it'll be good to see, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, that's hey. like the standard, like a, like a certain amount, that's a, officially so, so, when you're considered so I said, successful. No, so I said, hey, what, hey, I don't know anything about this. Mm-hmm. What is considered to be a successful yeah, book? Yeah, yeah. You know what the number was? Twenty thousand books. Dang. He goes, yeah. Hey, you know, if he goes, hey, you know, we're we're printing twelve thousand on this first run, and if you sell, if you you know, we'll print some more. But if you can sell twenty thousand books, that's that's gonna be that's a huge success, and yeah. we'll be we'll be proud. So here we are. We're one million Dang. deep. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Good job, Leif Babin. Good job. Good job, <laughs> both of you guys. Yeah. Leif Leif tells a story that we got home from Ramadi and. The only time I ever told him anything positive was when we got home and we'd been home for like two weeks and I told him and the Delta platoon commander, hey, good job over there. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so yeah, we're keep, we I likes to keep it real. Yeah, man. And actually, you know what though? Good job over there. Seems real simple, but I'm sure in that context, oh, yeah. it was probably the most loaded. Yeah. Good job, anyone's ever heard. Yeah, yeah. I believe you're correct. Beyond the books and beyond the podcast, also Echelon Front. Speaking of Leif and me, this is our leadership and management consulting company. This is the thing. Every this is a bold statement, right? Every problem in every organization is leadership problem. That's a bold statement to make. Yeah. And I'll say it again. Every problem in every organization is a leadership problem. So if there's a problem in an organization, the problem, it boils down to leadership on some level. So what we do is we fix the leadership and thereby we fix your problems. It's me. It's Leif Babin. It's J.P. Donnell. It's Dave Burke. Good deal, Dave Burke. Good deal, Dave. If you want to get in touch with us to have us come out and work with your company, get your leadership aligned, go to info at echelonfront.com. Or you email info at echelonfront.com. Or you can go to the website echelonfront.com. And, of course, we are approaching the muster. The leadership seminar. The. Learn. You learn tactics of leadership, you learn strategies of leadership, you learn pragmatic techniques you can execute as a leader that will make you and your team win. We already expanded the floor, so we expanded the floor as much as we could already because the the ticket sales are going quickly and so we've got both uh, places that we're doing the muster. We've got them expanded as much as we can. Doesn't matter. They're both both of them are going to sell out. Doing two this year only. Washington D.C. May seventeenth and eighteenth, and San Francisco October seventeenth and eighteenth. The whole team will be there, and we will be with you if you come. We'll be hanging out. We'll be answering questions. We'll be talking. We'll be eating lunch. We'll be we'll be hanging out, working out with all of you that come. There's no green room. There's no backstage. Where, where Leif is sitting back there in the backstage with cucumbers on his eyes to relax. That's not happening. No. No. We're hanging out, all of us. So you can register for that at extremeownership.com. We'll see you there. And until the muster, you can find us by interacting and conversing and cruising with us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram. And on that face, Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And once again, Dan Crenshaw is at Crenshaw for Congress dot com. His Twitter's at Dan Crenshaw TX, and his Facebook is Dan Crenshaw. And like to thank everyone for listening. Thanks to all the men and women in uniform across the globe with sword in hand and heart at the ready to fight and die for what we hold sacred and to police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, and all first responders. Thanks for being prepared and thanks for being there when we call you in our time of need and to everyone else out there thank you for listening and thank you for sharing and thank you for supporting but more important thanks for finding your mission and executing your mission whether it's your job or your business or a charity or your family or whatever your mission is thanks for getting out there and getting after it and so until next time this is dan crenshaw and echo and jocko out.